Hey everyone, this is Josh with another Bitcoin and blockchain tutorial available at chaintuts.com. And today we're going to be talking about an interesting technical topic, some of the cryptography that's used in Bitcoin. And in particular, we're going to be talking about cryptographically secure hash functions. We're going to talk about what some of the important properties of hashes are, what particular hash functions are most used in Bitcoin, and what some of the applications of hashing are in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency systems. So first, let's talk a little bit about the important properties of hash functions. And we're going to talk about some properties that apply to all hash functions, like the ones that might be used in hash table data structures, but we're mostly going to be focusing on the particular properties of cryptographically secure hash functions that are used in applications like cryptocurrencies. Now the first very important property of hash functions is that they are one-way functions. When you put an input into a hash function, you get an output. And that, and that hash output, often called the digest, is not something that you can plug into any formula or any algorithm to go back to the original input. These are often called trapdoor functions in cryptography because once the data falls into that trapdoor of the hash function, it can't go backwards to what it originally was. Now, as part of that, in particular, these cryptographically secure hash functions have a property called pre-image resistance. Remember that I said there's no algorithm or formula that you can use to go backwards from a hash output back to the input. But you can figure out what the original input was, and the only way to do that is by brute force guessing. So you have to try a bunch of inputs and run them all through the hash function and see if any of them simply match the output that you're looking for. But cryptographically secure hash functions make it so that there's no predictable uh, way to guess what the input was. It really is kind of a random guess that you have to do when you're doing this brute force uh, problem to find an original hash input. There's something that is uh, used in especially SHA-2 and RipeMD, these algorithms that are used in Bitcoin, that's called the waterfall effect. And what that means is that these algorithms are designed such that any small manipulation of the input results in a radically different hash output. So if you have the phrase hello there with an exclamation point and you run that through SHA, if you run that through SHA again without the exclamation point, you end up with a very, very different hash output. And finally, these hash functions are deterministic, meaning that for one input, you always get the same predictable output. Uh, if you go on any computer that has a properly implemented version of SHA-256, it doesn't matter what the programming language is or what the architecture is, if it's done right, you'll always get the same output for a particular input. And as we're going to see later, that's a pretty important property for things like proof-of-work mining and validating blocks on the blockchain. So now what functions in particular are used in Bitcoin? Uh, the first major one that people often hear about is SHA-256. This is part of the SHA-2 family of hashing algorithms, originally designed by the U.S. National Security Agency and published in 2001. And in particular, the 256-bit version of SHA is used in Bitcoin. That's 256 bits for the outputs, and that's often represented in 64 hexadecimal characters. The second one that we see in Bitcoin is RipeMD160. Uh, this was designed by a group of EU researchers in a more open source manner. Uh, in the initial versions were published in 1992 with an update published in 1996. Uh, this particular version that we're using in Bitcoin gives us a 160-bit output that's often represented as 40 hexadecimal characters. So now we know a little bit about the important properties of cryptographically secure hash functions, and we know which versions are used in Bitcoin, but how are these actually applied to cryptocurrency systems? Well, there's two particular applications I find to be really interesting and very important for securing these peer-to-peer -peer crypto networks. The first is proof-of-work mining. In Bitcoin, this uses SHA-256. 
So what happens is every 10 minutes or so on the Bitcoin blockchain, a new block of process transactions is added to the end of that chain. Now during this 10 minute period, what miners do is they group together uh, unconfirmed transactions into what they call a candidate block. They take the block header, which is like a sort of metadata summary of those transactions, add a random nonce value and run it through SHA-256. This gives an output that's called the block hash. And what all the parties on the network are looking for is that this block hash is actually less than a particular difficulty target set by the Bitcoin network. So there's a difficulty adjustment algorithm that all the peers running this software run, and it determines uh, what this particular number is going to be. So when you get a hash output, you treat it as a 256-bit integer and check that it's less than the difficulty target. If that is indeed the case, the miner has found a new valid block that will be accepted by the network, and then that's added to the chain and mining continues on. So it's very important, for example, that a hash function be deterministic because what this means is someone has to guess really, really hard. Uh, the miner has to do millions in, upon billions of guesses every 10 minutes to find an answer to this problem. But once an answer is found, anybody on the network, anyone running a full node, can run the block header and the nonce through SHA and immediately verify that that block header, the block hash, meets the difficulty target. So you have a mechanism then where you don't need trust to verify that somebody did a significant amount of work uh, and validate the transactions that occurred within that 10 minute period. Now, another really interesting application of hashing is with pay to public key hash addresses. Uh, many of you might understand that Bitcoin uses a public private key infrastructure or asymmetric cryptography as part of generating addresses. So you have a private key that is run through a cryptographic algorithm called elliptic curve algorithm, and uh, that gives you a public key at the end. But when you send Bitcoin to somebody's Bitcoin address, you're not actually sending it directly to the public key. What you're really sending it to is a hash of the public key. So the most common Bitcoin address format takes the private key, runs it through uh, the elliptic curve algorithm, get you the public key, but then that public key is run through one round of SHA-256, one round of RIPE-MD-160, and is then encoded in a format which is uh, base-56 encoding, base-58 check for Bitcoin legacy addresses, or a, uh, another format called cash adder for Bitcoin cash addresses. But the underlying algorithm is the same. You're actually paying to a hash of the public key, hence pay to public key hash addresses. Now what this actually does is this adds an extra layer of security to your Bitcoin addresses. So you hold a private key that you can't tell to anyone else because anyone with that private key can sign a new transaction and spend the Bitcoin held at that address. Now, normally, uh, ECDSA going from the public key to the private key is not a reversible process, but there does exist vulnerabilities that have been implemented in wallets, um, such as reusing K values for signing, that can allow somebody to recover a private key from a public key and a signature. There is also future potential for things like quantum computing to potentially break something like ECDSA. However, hash functions are not vulnerable to uh, quantum computing, and adding these hash functions also removes the possibility of a bad ECDSA implementation being used to steal funds. And the reason is, when you originally pay to that Bitcoin address, you're paying to a hash of the public key. You can't go backwards from the hash of the public key back to the original public key, because that's the one-way nature of hash functions. So if you never reuse the address, nobody can ever know what the actual public key is. You send some funds to that address and you, and you keep them there, uh, maybe for longer term holding, and nobody knows what the public key is until you go to spend those funds. When you create a new transaction to spend the funds at your address, the public key is revealed as part of the scripts that run during that process. But then if you throw away that address with a now zero balance and never reuse it, that means that nobody can attack 
any vulnerabilities and use that private key that they might recover to steal your funds. So I just think the cryptography used in Bitcoin is really, really fascinating. Uh, you know, in terms of the internal workings, these algorithms are pretty complex and, and sometimes hard to wrap your head around. But the applied cryptography part of this is so fascinating. Understanding the properties of these hash functions and elliptic curves and understanding how they're used to build this peer-to-peer -peer system that doesn't rely on trust is just really amazing. So as always, there is a written tutorial on the Chain Tutorials website that accompanies this video. There are some more written out examples of hashing that might be useful to you if you learn that way. And uh, some code snippets uh, that are written in Python so you can actually play around with some hashing yourself. And as always, I wanna thank you very much for watching this video and learning something new about Bitcoin with me today.